ڈاکٹر ذاکر عبد الکریم نائک ہوئی پریزنٹلی دی سیکرٹری جنرل آف دی اسلامک ریسرچ فاؤنڈیشن ان بامبے ڈاکٹر عبد الکریم ذاکر عبد الکریم ایز یو کین آبزرو از کوائٹ اے یگ مین میئرلی ٹوئنٹی نائن ایئرس اولڈ بٹ الحمد للہ از کوائٹ اینرجیٹک اینڈ ہیز سیکریفائز ہز کیریئر ایز اے ڈاکٹر اونلی ٹو سرو ہیومین آئی ول وانٹ ٹو ٹیک مچ مور آف یور ٹائم اینڈ آر پریزینٹ ڈاکٹر ذاکر عبد الکریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اولم یر الزین کفرو ان سماوات والارد کان ذرت کم فتکنا ہما وجعلنا من المائی کل شعین ہے افلا یؤمنون بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شوہل صدری و یسر لی امری وحل العقدت من لسانی یفقہ قولی I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہو meaning may peace, blessings and mercy of almighty Allah be on all of you the topic of the talk as mentioned by brother Muhammad Sayyid is the Quran and science conflict or conciliation the Quran happens to be the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the last and final messenger Muhammad may peace be upon him as a mercy to the whole of mankind for any book to claim that it is the word of God for any scripture to claim that it is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it has to stand the test of time it has to prove itself to be the word of God in all the ages previously in the olden age it was the age of miracles the age of maujuza Al-Quran happens to be the miracle of the miracles then later on came the age of literature and poetry Muslims and non-Muslims both claim that Al-Quran is the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth and there is a challenge given in the Holy Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 23 and 24 which says وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا and if you and if you are in doubt as what we have revealed to our servant prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him from time to time فَتُّوا بِسُورَةً مِّن مِّسْلِ then produce a surah like it وَدْعُوا شُوَدَعَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ and call forth your witnesses if there are any besides Allah if your doubts are true فَإِن لَمْ تَفَلُوا and if we cannot وَلَن تَفَلُوا and of a surety cannot فَتَّقُ النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُدُوهَ النَّاسَ بِلِجَارَ then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones وَدَّتِ الْكَافِرِينَ which is prepared for those who reject The Quran gives a challenge that you should produce a surah like it. A similar challenge is repeated in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 38, that produce a surah like it, as well as in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 14, produce 10 surahs like it, and in Surah Tur, chapter number 52, verse number 38, that produce a recital like it, as well as in Surah Isra chapter number 17 verse number 88 that if all the mankind and jinn if they got together to produce the like of the Quran they will not be able to do so even if they help each other this challenge is yet a standing challenge to the whole of humanity and so far in the past 1400 years 
No one was able to produce a furrah like it. But today, if you tell to a modern man that suppose a particular scripture tells in a very poetic fashion that the world is flat, will you believe it? Today is not the age of poetry and literature. Today is the age of science. So let's analyze whether the Quran and science, whether they conflict or they conciliate, whether they contradict or whether they're compatible. According to the famous physicist Albert Einstein, who also received the Nobel Prize, he said, science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. I would like to repeat it. According to Albert Einstein, science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Let me remind you that the Quran is not a book of science. It is a book of signs. It is not a book of signs, S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It is a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. -S. And there are more than 6,000 signs, that is ayats, in the Quran, of which more than a thousand are scientifically based. As far as the talk of today is concerned, I will only be speaking about the scientific facts which have been proved. I won't be speaking about hypotheses and theories because as you may be knowing, many a times science has taken new turns, which I will give a few examples during the course of my talk. Today I will only be speaking about the scientific facts which have been proved to be 100% sure. When a non-Muslim who does not have much knowledge about Islam, when he examines the Quran, he does not find in it what he expects to find. He thinks that as the Quran is a very old book revealed 1400 years ago, it will be having matter which is outdated. And since it was revealed in the deserts of Arabia, it will be mainly talking about the desert life. The Quran does speak about desert life, but it also speaks about the life at sea. There was one of our Muslim brother who lived in Canada in Toronto who gave the Holy Quran to a non-Muslim friend who was a marine, who was a sailor, who knew nothing about Islam. That non-Muslim sailor, he read the Quran with enthusiasm. And after he completed it, he turned it back to the Muslim friend and said that I believe that your Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him, he was a sailor. Because the Quran describes the storm in the ocean with very accurate details, which can only be described by a person who himself has been at sea. So the Muslim brother replied, No, Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him, he led his complete life in the desert on verifying that non-Muslim was so impressed he said this book can only be a divine revelation and he accepted Islam for that non-Muslim that one verse was sufficient for him to accept Islam some people may require 10 verses some may require approximately 100 signs some people even if thousand signs are given, they will not accept the truth. So let's analyze whether the Quran and science, whether they conflict or they conciliate. Firstly, I like to speak about astronomy. In 1973, a couple of non-Muslim scientists, they got the Nobel Prize for describing the creation of the universe. And they called it the Big Bang Theory. According to the Big Bang Theory, initially there was one mass, that was the primary nebula. Later on, there was an explosion which gave rise to galaxies which later formed planets, stars, sun, moon, including 
our earth. The similar thing is mentioned in the Quran in a nutshell. And I start my talk by quoting an ayat from the Quran from Surah Al Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Awalam yaral lazina kafru. Do not the unbelievers see anna samawati wal arda kana taratkan fataqna huma that the heavens and the earth they were joined together and we clove them asunder this verse of the Quran was revealed 1400 years ago and it describes the big bang theory in a nutshell imagine the Quran speaks about the big bang theory 1400 years ago previously the European scientists as well as the philosophers they thought that the earth is the center of the universe and they believed that all the planets including the sun they revolved around the earth this theory of geocentrism was thought to be correct from the second century BC at the time of Ptolemy till as late as the 16th century until Copernicus when he said that the Sun is the center of the solar system and that the earth revolves around the Sun later on in 1609 another German scientist Johannes Kepler he wrote the Astronema Nova and he said that not only do the planets revolve they also rotate about the axis the planets including the earth there is a particular verse in the Quran from Surah Al-Ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 33 which had put me in doubts when I was in school in 1981 I had learned in geography that the Sun is stationary that the Sun does not rotate about its axis but when I read the Quran in Surah Al-Ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 33 it says Huwa ladhi khalaqa layl wa nahara it is Allah who has created the night and the day wa shams wa kamar the sun and the moon kullun fi falakin yasbahoon each one traveling in orbit with its own motion the Arabic word used is Yazbaha coming from the root word Sabaha which describes the motion of a moving body if I say a person is doing Yazbaha on the floor it will not mean he's rolling it will mean he's walking or running if I say a person is doing Yazbaha in water it will not mean he's floating it will mean he's swimming similarly when we use this term Yasbaha for a heavenly body it will not mean it is flying but it will mean rotating about its own axis so the Quran says that the sun revolves as well as rotates about its own axis this was discovered recently just a couple of decades ago in which you can prove that the sun rotates by a simple experiment since you can't see the sun for a long time with the naked eye you can have equipment which can project its image on the tabletop and you'll find that there are black spots in the sun which take approximately 25 days to complete one rotation so in short the sun rotates the sun takes 25 days, days to complete one rotation today this scientific fact has been incorporated in most of the textbooks so if you analyze the Quran the Quran does not conflict but conciliates with science the similar thing is also mentioned in Surah Yaseen chapter number 36 verse number 40 each one traveling in orbit with its own motion and that verse also says that it is not permitted for the sun to catch up with the moon nor the night to outstrip the day what does the Quran mean that it is not permitted for the sun to catch up with the moon it means 
that both the orbit of the sun and the moon they are different it's giving an indication to the astronomers that the orbit of the sun and moon they are different Quran also mentions in Surah Yaseen chapter number 36 verse number 40 which says وَشَّمْ سُكَمَرْ لِمُسْتَقَرِّ اللَّهَا that the sun rotates about its orbit to a place determined the Arabic word here is mustaqar means to a place determined to a time appointed science tells us today that the light of the sun is due to a chemical reaction which is taking place since billions of years and one day this chemical reaction will end and the sun will extinguish it the same thing the Quran mentions that the sun is moving to a place determined and one day it will extinguish and science tells us today that the sun is moving towards a point in the universe which is called as the solar apex which is there in the constellation of Hercules and it's moving at a speed of about 12 miles per second the similar thing about the sun going to extinguish is mentioned in Surah Luqman chapter number 21 sorry chapter number 31 verse number 29 as well as in Surah Zumar chapter number 39 verse number 5 previously the scientists they thought that the sun sorry the earth was flat and people they were afraid to venture too far because they were scared that they will fall over but they had no proof that the earth was flat it was just an assumption in 1597 Sir Francis Drake was the first person who proved that the world is spherical by sailing around it the Quran mentions in Surah Luqman chapter number 31 verse number 29 that fear thou not that Allah merges the night into day and the day into night <coughs> what is the meaning of the night merging into day it means that the night gradually and slowly changes into day and similarly the day gradually and slowly changes into night this phenomena is only possible if the shape of the earth is spherical it's not possible if the shape of the earth is flat because if the earth is flat there will be a sudden change a similar thing is mentioned in Surah Al-Zumar chapter number 39 verse number 5 which says it is Allah that overlaps the night unto the day and the day unto the night it is Allah which coils the night unto the day and the day unto the night the Arabic word used here is kawara meaning to coil as though a person coils the turban around the head the Quran says the night overlaps or coils over the day and the day overlaps or coils unto the night this phenomena is only possible if the shape of the earth is spherical it's not possible if it's flat previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light but now after science has advanced we know that the light of the moon is not its own light but it's a reflected light if you read the Quran the Arabic word for the Sun is Shams it's referred to as Siraj means a blazing lamp or Bahaj means a torch the Sun is referred to as Siraj or Bahaj and the Arabic word for moon is Qamar it is referred to as Noor means reflection of light or as Munir meaning borrowed light this is mentioned in Surah Furqan chapter number 25 verse number 61 it is Allah who has made the constellation and he has placed therein the sun as a torch and the moon which has borrowed light But if you refer to the Bible, 
in Genesis chapter number 1, it says that God created two bodies of light, the sun and the moon, both having their own lights. The sun was referred to as the greater body of light which governed the day and the moon as the lesser body of light which governed the night. But the Quran differs. It says the light of the sun is its own light and the light of the moon is reflected light. No place in the Quran is the sun referred to as Noor or Munir and neither is the moon referred as Siraj or Wahaj. And the Arabic word for star in the Quran is Najam. It's referred to as Thakib. The light as it pierces through the darkness it consumes itself by the time it reaches the earth. The Quran also mentions that we have created the sky as a protected ceiling. Today science tells us that the atmosphere we have it acts as a filter and prevents the short waves such as x-rays and ultraviolet rays from entering into the surface of the earth and because of this atmosphere that's the reason that life is able to sustain itself on the earth otherwise life will not exist on this earth and the Quran mentioned we have created the sky as a protected ceiling according to Edwin Havo he said that in the present in the present century we have discovered that the galaxies they are receding from each other if you read the Quran in Surah Al-Dhariyat chapter number 51 verse number 47 it says that we have created the firmaments and we have made the universe as a vast expanse the Quran refers to the universe as expanding which has been confirmed recently by Edwin Havo by these astronomical data we come to know that the Quran does not conflict but conciliates with modern science there may be a few non-Muslims who may say that it is nothing great that the Quran mentions about astronomical facts since the Arabs were far advanced in the field of astronomy I do agree with these non-Muslims that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy but I would like to remind them that the Quran was revealed centuries before the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy in fact it was not because the Arabs were advanced that the Quran speaks about astronomy it is because the Quran speaks about astronomy that the Arabs were much advanced in the field of astronomy now coming to physics the famous theory of atomism which came into existence 23 centuries ago which were described by the Greeks especially the Democrats and later on even the Arabs knew about this theory and according to this theory atom was the smallest particle that was existing and the Arabs called this atom by an Arabic word as Zarra Zarra means a minute particle and they referred this atom as a Zarra but today science has further advanced and we come to know <coughs> that though atom is the smallest unit of matter having the characteristics of the element it too can be divided <coughs> so people may think that now the Quran is outdated since the Quran mentioned in Surah Azal that you shall be able to see even an atom's weight of good deed as well as an atom's weight of evil that you do so people may think the Quran is outdated but if you read Surah Sabah chapter number 34 verse number 3 it says that when the unbelievers say that the hour of judgment will not come tell them it will surely come by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has the knowledge of the unseen and has the knowledge of everything as minute as the atom which is there in the heaven or the earth and even things which are lesser or greater than the atom 
So Quran mentioned that there are things lesser than the atom. So Quran is not outdated, it is most up to date. Now coming to geography. It was in 1580 that Bernard Palissy he described the water cycle that we know today. And according to him, the water evaporated from the oceans and it forms cloud. These clouds traveled and later condensed and they rose and they fell as rain. And this rainwater went into the ground and later on drained into the oceans. And this cycle was repeated. Previously, in the 7th century, according to Fay of Meletus, he described that the vapors, the spray of the ocean, they were thrust into the interior of the land which fell as rain. And later on, whatever water that was there present in the land as lakes and seas was due to the thrust of the wind on the ocean. And this water returned into the oceans by a secret passage which was called the abyss. And at the, and at the time of the plateau, it was referred as Tartarus. This theory has been proved to be wrong today. But even in as late as the 17th century, people believed in the Descartes theory. As well as in the 19th century, people believed in the Aristotle theory that water collected in the mountain caverns which fed the lakes and seas. But today we know that the water that's present in the lake and the river is due to the rainwater. It's described in the Quran in a nutshell in Surah Zumar, chapter number 39. Verse number 21 which says that it is Allah which sends down water from the skies and makes it to soak in the cracks of the ground and causes sown field of different colors to grow. This verse describes the water cycle in a nutshell. A similar thing is mentioned in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 24 that it is Allah that sends down water from the skies and causes the dead land to live, to come back to life again. It is also mentioned in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18, that it is Allah who sends down water from the sky and we make it to store into the ground and we can make it to drain. Again, if you refer to Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22, it says that we cause fecundating winds, we cause impreg impregnating winds and then let water fall from the sky. The Arabic word used here is lavaki, which is the plural of lakhi coming from the root word lakaha, which means to impregnate or to fecundate. What is the meaning of the word impregnate. It means that the pollen that's there in the air, it impregnates the cloud and causes the rain to fall. And the other meaning can also be that the clouds, they join together and they combine and cause condensation which causes rainfall. This is also mentioned in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43, that we cause the clouds to move gently and cause them to join and then to form a heap and then we cause water to flow from them. The same verse, Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43 also says that we cause rain to fall from mountain clouds. Now today if we go in the aeroplane and we see down, we will see that the clouds appear as mountains. After the science is advanced, we come to know that the Quran does not conflict but conciliates with science. Now, now coming to the field of geology, according to the recent advances made in the field of geology, we come to know about a phenomena called as folding which gives rise to the mountain ranges that we have today. 
the earth that we live on, the surface is solid. But the deeper layers, it is hot and fluid, which is not hospitable for any living life. According to the phenomena of folding, the mountain ranges, they give stability to the earth. The radius of the earth is 3,750 miles. But the surface, the earth's crust, is only about 1 to 10 miles in thickness, which is very thin. That's the reason the earth can shake. And this mountain ranges act as pegs, as 10 pegs, and prevent the surface of the earth from shaking. This thing is mentioned in Surah Nabah, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, that we have made the earth as an expanse, was Jabala Autada, and the mountain as pegs, as stakes. The Arabic word Autad means pegs or stakes. So the Quran mentions that the mountains we have made as pegs. The similar thing is mentioned in Surah Al Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, that we have made the mountains standing firm, lest the surface of the earth will shake. Means the reason for why the mountains were made is clearly described in the Quran, lest the surface of the earth should shake. Now coming to oceanology. There's a verse in the Quran from Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says that it is Allah who has created two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palpable and the other salt and bitter. And he has created a barrier between them, a partition which is forbidden to be transgressed. The same thing is mentioned in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 19, which says that Allah has created two bodies of flowing water and a barrier between them. Now, after the advancement in the field of oceanology, we know that though the salt and sweet water meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier. And the Arabic word used is barzakh. This barrier can't be seen. It is an unseen barrier. The same word barzakh is also used for the interim life between the death and resurrection. It's an unseen barrier, barzakh. This can clearly be seen in the waters of Cape as well as in Egypt when Nile, when River Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea as well as into the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf Stream which flows for thousands of miles. It starts from the Gulf of Mexico and goes on the western coast of Northern America and then flows eastwards onto the west coast of Europe from the east coast of Northern America to the west coast of Europe. And throughout the thousands of miles, both the water, sweet and the bitter water, the salt water, though they meet, but they do not mix. And if you're traveling along this Gulf Stream, and if you take water from the left side and water from the right side, you will find that both are different. One is sweet and the other is salty. And even the temperature differs between the two. After science is advanced, we come to know that the Quran does not conflict but conciliate with science. Now coming to the field of biology. I had started the talk by quoting the verse from Surah Al Ambiya chapter number 21, verse number 30, which also says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ قَفَرُوا أَنَّ ثَمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتْ رَتْكٍ فَتَقْنَهُمَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ هَيْ وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ means we have created from water every living thing. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ هَيْ Will they not then believe? Ms. Quran says we have created every living thing from water. Imagine, this verse was revealed 
1400 years ago in the deserts of Arabia where there was scarcity of water. Who could have believed at that time in that place in the desert that every living thing was created from water? Now, after science has advanced, we come to know that cytoplasm, which is the major substance of the cell, consists of 80% of water. And every living creature consists of 50-90% of water. If you read the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45 says, We have created every animal from water. And in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 54, it says, we have created every human being from water. Coming to the field of biology, later on to botany. In botany, we learn that the plants have sex. Previously, we did not know that the plants had male and female. Recently, we have come to know in botany, that the plants have got specific sexes, male and female. And even those plants which are unisex, they have distinct characteristics of male and female. The Quran mentioned in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that we have sent down water from the skies and have produced diverse plants, diverse pairs of plants, each separate from the other. The Quran says that we have created the plants in pairs. And in Surah Raad, chapter number 13, verse number 3, it says, we have created the fruits in pairs, two and two. Means even the fruits have got sexes, male and female. And if you read Surah al dhariyat chapter number 51, verse number 49, it says, we have created everything in pairs. We have created everything in pairs. Not only the animal life, the plant life and the fruit life and the human life, everything. It can also refer to a phenomena as electricity. Today we know that electricity has got a negative and a positive charge. That means they are created in pairs. And Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 36 says that we have created in pairs everything what the earth produces including the humankind and everything what they don't know means besides all the other things created in pairs even the thing which the human being does not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in pairs in the field of zoology we have come to know that the birds and the animals they live in communities. They live together. This description is given for Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38. That Allah has created everything that walks on the earth, all the animals, including the beings that fly with wings, to form as community, to live as communities. This verse has been proved recently by science. If you read Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, it says that we have taught the bees to build its cells in hills, on trees and in human habitations and to eat of what the earth produces. And we have taught the bee to find the path of thy Lord with skills. Today, after science has advanced, we know that whenever a bee finds a new flower or a new garden, it goes and describes the way how to find the new garden or the flower to its fellow bee by the flapping of its wings. This can only be proved by a very sophisticated method of photography that the bee transmits and shows the map and the path to its fellow being by the flapping of its wings. And the same verse, Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, says that the bees go out to collect food. 
And the gender used here is fasluki. It's the female gender. The Quran mentions that the female bee are the worker bees. But previously we thought that it was the male bee which used to go out and do the work. If you would have read the play of Shakespeare, Henry IV, in it it says that the male bee are the soldier bee and the report to the king bee. Today we come to know that it is the female bee which are the worker bee and the report to the queen bee, not the king bee. So the Quran, the gender which the Quran uses is the female gender, first looky. Again, if you read in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 41, it says that for those who take for protectors besides Allah, they are like the spiders. The spiders build for itself a home, and verily, the house of the spider is very fragile. The Quran, besides referring to the people, those who take for protectors besides Allah, like the spider, besides describing the physical nature of the house of the spider, that is the web, as being fragile and delicate, it also refers to the nature of the spider, the family of the spider, in which many a times the female spider kills the male spider. Besides the physical nature of the house being delicate, even, even the relationship between the male and the female spider is very delicate. If you read Surah Nahal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, it says that before Solomon and his army matched, marched the hosts of jinns, men and bird. And when they approached a lowly valley of ant, one of the ants said, O ye ants, get ye into the habitation, lest Solomon and his army will trample you under their feet unknowingly. If you would have read this particular verse a few years ago, you may have thought that it is a fairy tale book in which the ants are speaking to each other. It may be a mythology in which the ants are speaking to one another. Today, after the advancement of science, we know that the animal or the insect which has a lifestyle closest to the human being, it's, it's the ant. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 69, that from the belly of the bee, we give you a drink of varying colors in which there is a healing for mankind. The Quran mentions that the, in the honey, there is a healing for mankind. Today we know that the honey has got mild antiseptic property. That's the reason that the Russian soldiers, they used honey to cover the wound, in which the moisture was prevented from being evaporated and it left very little scar tissue. And due to the density of the honey, fungus and bacteria could not grow in that wound. If a man is suffering from the allergy of a particular plant, and if you give him honey from that particular plant, that person starts developing resistance. Now coming to the field of physiology, there is one particular verse which is of very much importance in the Quran. It was 600 years after the Quran was revealed that Ibn Nafis, he described the blood circulation. And 400 years after he described, William Harvey made it famous to the Western world. But 1400 years ago, this particular description of the, of the blood circulation is described in the Quran. In short, the food that we eat, it enters into the intestine. And from the intestine, it is absorbed into the bloodstream via a complex media, most probably through the liver. And from the bloodstream, these food constituents are transported to almost all the organs, including the mammary glands, which produce the milk. 
The same thing is mentioned in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66. That verily in the cattle is a lesson for you. We give you from drink, we give you to drink from within the bodies, which is coming from the conjunction of the constituent of the intestine and blood, milk which is pure and pleasant. This verse of the Quran describes the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell. Imagine, this was mentioned 1400 years ago. Quran also mentioned in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, that in the cattle there is an instructive sign for you. We give you a drink from within the bodies and many are the multiple benefits and of their meat you can eat. The Quran describes the production of milk in a nutshell 1400 years ago. Now in the field of embryology, there were a few Arabs who collected all the data which the Quran mentioned about embryology and followed the instruction of the Quran which says, if you are in doubt, ask the person who knows. So they took all the matter on embryology and presented it to Professor Keith Moore who happens to be the head and chairman of the department of embryology in the University of Toronto in Canada. And he happens to be one of the highest authority in the field of embryology. And they asked him that whatever the Quran speaks about embryology, is it compatible with the latest discoveries in embryology? Professor Keith Moore had all the verses translated and he examined them and he said that most of the matter which the Quran speaks about embryology is 100% perfect. But there is a few data in the Quran which I cannot comment whether it is true or false because I myself do not know about it. And one of these were the verses from the Quran from Surah al alaq chapter 96, verse number 1 and 2 which says, Ikra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq, khalaq al insana min alaq. Read, recite, proclaim in the name of thy Lord who created, who created man from something which clings, a leech-like substance. So Prophet Keith Moore said, I do not know whether the embryo in the initial stages looks like a leech or not. So he went back in his laboratory and under a very powerful microscope, he examined the initial stage of an embryo and compared it with a photograph of a leech and he was shocked at the striking resemblance of the two. Later on, Prophet Keith Moore, whatever additional knowledge he acquired from the Quran and from the Hadith, he added into his book, The Developing Human. And he revised his old edition and wrote the third edition. And he got the award for the best medical book written in that year by a single author. And this book was later on translated into several languages of the world. If you refer to the Quran, it's mentioned in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 5 and 7, that does not man know from what he is created? He is created from a drop emitted from a space between the vertebral column, that's the backbone and the ribs. Today, after the advancement of embryology, we know that the gonad of the human beings, that the testicle and the ovaries, initially in the embryonic stages, they evolve from the same space as the kidney, that is the space between the vertebral column and the 11th and 12th rib. And later on, these ovary and testes, the descent. In the female, the ovary descends into the true pelvis. And in the males, the testini, the testes, through the inguinal canal descends to the scrotum. And even in the adult life, the blood supply, the nerve supply and the lymphatic drainage is yet from the same space, 
from the space between the vertebral column and the 11th and the 12th ribs. The Quran says that in Surah Hajj, chapter 22, verse number 5, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 14, that man is created from a nutfa, from a minute quantity of liquid. What is the meaning of nutfa? Nutfa means a very minute quantity of liquid, similar to the trickle, that when you empty a cup, the small minute quantity that remains in the cup is called as a nutfa. It's a very minute quantity. Today we come to know that only one sperm is enough to fertilize the ovum. In a normal emission, 300 million sperms are emitted, of which only one is sufficient to fertilize the ovum. Means the minute quantity required is 1 upon 300 millionth. And percentage-wise, it is 0.00000003. 0.8003 such a minute quantity is required for the fertilization of the ovum and the Quran refers to it as nutfa again in the Quran in Surah Insan chapter 76 verse number 2 it says Lakat khalaknal insana min nutfatin amsaj that man is created from a mingled from a minute quantity of mingled liquid what does the Quran mean by mingled liquids? Means beside the spermatic fluid, even the prostatic fluid helps and facilitates in the movement of the sperm. That's why the Quran refers to it as the mingled liquid, as the mingled fluid. In the field of genetics, we have come to know today that it is mainly the sperm which is responsible for the sex of the child. The sex of the child is determined by the 23rd pair of chromosomes. If it's XX, it is a female. If it's XY, it's a male. The Quran says in Surah Najam, chapter 53, verse number 45 and 46, that we have created man from a minute quantity of liquid. Coming forth from the male, the Arabic word used is tumna, which refers to a male. It can't refer to a female. The Arabic word tumna means gushing forth from a male. A minute quantity of liquid which gushes forth from a male. The Quran says it is the male fluid. It is the sperm which is responsible for the sex of the child. Similar thing is mentioned in Surah Qiyamah, chapter 75, verse number 37 and 39 that we have created man from a minute quantity of sperm and made him into something which clings and then into a chewed like lump and then gave it sex male and female the Quran says Nutfatin Maniyan means a minute quantity of sperm is responsible for the sex of the child in Indian society we normally have the mother-in-laws that when they want a son and when the daughter-in-law gives birth to a female child, they normally blame the daughter-in-law. It actually depends upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether the child is a male or female. But if you have to blame someone, you have to blame the father, not the mother. Because it is the sperm which is responsible for the sex of the child. So you can't blame the mother. Again the Quran says that we have created the human being in the womb of the mother creation after creation in three waves of darkness according to professor Keith Moore these three waves of darkness refers to the anterior abdominal wall to the uterine wall and to the amniocorionic membrane these three waves of darkness is mentioned in the Quran again the Quran describes the various embryonic stages in detail if you read Surah Mu'minun Chapter 23, verse number 12, 13 and 14, it says, We have created man from a quintessence of clay and then made him into something which clings and placed him in a place of fixed and firm place and then made 
that something which clings into a chewed like lump and made that chewed like lump into bone and then clothed the bone with flesh and muscles ah Allah is the best of creators this verses of the Quran describe the embryonic stages in detail besides saying that the human being is created from a nutfa from a minute quantity of liquid it says it is placed in a place which is firm and secure the Arabic word is karar and makin a safe place today science tells us that the fetus is protected behind by the vertebral column and the posterior muscles besides it's also protected by the amniochorionic membrane the amnio that is amniotic sac as well as the amniotic fluid and the verse continues and then we made it into something which clings a leech like substance as I said that the early stage of an embryo resembles that of a leech and besides that it behaves like a leech the fetus in the initial stages it clings to the womb of the mother it behaves like a leech it clings to the womb of the mother then the verse continues and then we fashion it into a chewed like lump Prophet Keith Moore he took a plaster seal and shaped it into the early stage of embryo and bit it between his teeth to resemble a mudga a chewed like lump and then he examined it and those teeth mark resembled the somites in the early stage of development of the human beings and the verse continues then we made it into bone which means is a man and closed it with lahem that is flesh and then we made it into another creature what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean by saying then we made it into another creature what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean by saying then we made it into another creature it means that by science we have come to know that the early development stages of the embryo in the rabbit in the fish and all the other animals is the same as the human being only after this stage does the stages differ therefore the Quran says then we made it into another creature all the previous embryonic stages are exactly the same as the other animals only after this do the stages differ and then we can identify the head and the hands and the feet of the human beings if you read Surah Hajj chapter 22 verse number 5 it says that we have created man from dust and it made it into something which clings and then formed it into a tube like lump partly formed and partly unformed embryology today tells us that at this stage the cells of the embryo are partly formed and partly unformed and the organs also are partly formed and partly unformed this is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Hajj chapter 22 verse number 5 again if you refer to the Quran in Surah Qiyamah chapter number 75 verse number 3 it says that the unbelievers ask how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again reconstruct the bones on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers saying that we will not only reconstruct the bones we shall even reconstruct the very fingertips why does Allah refer in the Quran as we shall not only reconstruct the bone even the fingertips in 1880 it, the method of identification that was discovered was fingerprint method in which they could easily identify the criminal or anyone involved by the method of fingerprinting in which it says that even in a million people no two fingerprints are identical so the Quran says we shall not only reconstruct the bones we shall even reconstruct the very fingertips <coughs> this is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago I would like to end my talk by giving the example of Prophet Takashan 
Previously, in medicine, we thought that the brain is only responsible for the feeling of the pain. But today we know that it is even the pain receptors that are present in the skin which is responsible for the feeling of pain. That's the reason when any person suffering from any burn injury comes to a doctor, the doctor takes a pin and he puts and he presses into the burn. If the patient feels pain, the doctor is happy. That means the pain receptors are intact and it's a superficial burn. If the patient does not feel pain, it means that the pain receptors have been destroyed and it's a deep burn. There's a verse in the Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 56, which says that as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them in the hellfire. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall replace them with new skin so that they shall feel the pain. So the Quran says that we shall replace the skin so that they shall feel the pain. It means that even the skin is responsible for the feeling of the pain. Prophet Tagasha, who comes from Thailand and who spent a great deal of time in the field of pain receptors, when he was shown this verse, he could not believe that the Quran mentions this thing 1400 years ago. Afterwards, afterwards, later verifying with the Quran and in confirmation with Prophet Keith Moore, he was satisfied that the Quran mentions about the pain receptors 1400 years ago. He was so impressed that in the conference which was being held in Cairo on the scientific science of the Quran and Sunnah, he accepted Islam in the conference and said, Ashadu anna ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah that I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him is the messenger of Allah wa akhru dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen now if there are any questions on the topic or if you require any clarification on the subject of Quran and modern science conflict or conciliation then you are most welcome to pose it any questions or any clarification or any doubts regarding the topic of Quran and modern science conflict or conciliation so the question that while I was describing the verse of the Quran Surah Mu'minun chapter 23 verse number 12 to 14 I said that human being is created from Alaq it's also mentioned in Surah Alaq chapter 96 verse number 1 and 2 brother wants to know what is this leech the leech is a sort of an insect which you find it is black in color it is long and oval and it's called as a blood sucker and when it gets attached to the skin it sucks the blood and it's very difficult to remove it so the Quran says that in the initial stages the embryo looks like a leech and, and when you observe the shape of the initial stage of the embryo it resembles that of a leech and besides the shape resembling that of a leech even it behaves like a leech it clings the fetus in the womb of the mother clings to the uterus in the same fashion as a leech clings to the human body hope that answers the question that brother has asked me a question that when the child is in the mother's womb does the hearing come first or the sight since I had to, since I had to end the talk very early I did not mention many scientific points mentioned in the Quran if you read the Quran in Surah Sajda chapter number 32 verse number 9 it says it is Allah who gives the hearing, the sight, and understanding and feeling. Similar thing is mentioned in Surah Insan, chapter 76, verse number 2. It is Allah which gives the hearing and sight. So Quran says, first comes the hearing, then comes the sight. By medical knowledge we come to know today that the ear is the first sense that comes in the embryo, in the fetus of the human being. And by the fifth month of pregnancy, the ear is developed and the eye splits open by the seventh month of pregnancy so Quran confirms with the medical knowledge we have today first comes the hearing then comes the sight hope that answers the question yes from the sister's side any questions the 
The lady has posed the question that are there any mathematical facts in the Quran? And Quran, as I told you, <coughs> speaks about various subjects and topics. It also speaks about mathematics. If you know about the theory of Aristotle, the theory of Aristotle which was the base of mathematics, and according to the theory of Aristotle it said, it says that any statement, any proposition can either be true or false. The theory was called as the theory of the excluded middle. That any statement can be true or false. And the full mathematics was based on this theory of Aristotle. Just a couple of hundred years ago, one particular person posed the question, what if this particular statement of Aristotle itself is false? As he said, any statement can be true or false, even this statement can be false. So the whole theory had fallen apart and mathematics, ma mathematics had fallen apart. So later on, they came upon a consensus that whenever a word is used, it can either be mentioned or the meaning can be used. I like to give a few examples. That a word, it can either be used as a meaning or just as a mentioning. I'll give you an example. If I say that Akbar is a small child, Akbar is a small child. Here, I'm mentioning the word, it's a proper noun. I'm not using the meaning. But if someone knows Arabic, he will say, Akbar does not mean small, it means great. So here when I use the word Akbar, I'm only mentioning it. I'm not using its meaning. Therefore, Akbar is a small child is correct. But the moment I take the meaning, it becomes false. Because Akbar does not mean small, it means great. I'd like to give you another example. If I say that 3 comes before 4, does anybody have objection out here? No one has objection. 3 comes before 4. By the meaning, no one will have objection. But if a person is skeptical, he may take objection and tell me that if you see in the dictionary, 3 comes after 4 because T comes after F. So you are proved wrong. So here we are talking about mentioning of the word, not the meaning. When a person says 3 comes after 4, he is talking about mentioning, not the meaning. Meaning wise, no one will have objection that 3 comes before 4. So in the same fashion, there is a verse in the Quran which says, Afalayat the burun al Quran, walaukana minin the garilla, lavajadu fik tilafan kasira. It's from Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 82, which says that Afalayat al burun al Quran, they do not consider the Quran with care. Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been contradictions, there would have been discrepancies in the Quran. And it's a challenge that no one can take out any contradiction in the Quran. Can anyone take out? Alhamdulillah, no one can take out. But if a skeptical person comes, he will tell you that I can show you a contradiction in the Quran. You say, where? So he will say, open Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 82, the word contradiction is mentioned there. That means there is a contradiction in the Quran. But analyze the word carefully. The Quran says, do not they consider the Quran with care. Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. And if you analyze the full Quran, the word contradiction has been only mentioned once. So again you are safe. The Quran does not trip itself. It says many contradictions and the word contradiction is only mentioned once. But again the skeptical person will say, okay, I agree with you, contradiction is mentioned only once. But the Quran says, do not they consider the Quran with care. Had it been from anyone other than Allah, there would have been many contradictions. The word many contradictions is there in the Quran. Therefore it is not from Allah. So again you are trapped. But the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was very careful when he revealed the Quran. Now if you analyze, the theory of vice versa is not always true. I'd like to give an example. If I say that all the people living in Durban are South Africans. No one has objection to that. But the vice versa is not true. All South Africans do not live in Durban. When I say all people living in Durban are South Africans, the vice versa need not be true. All South Africans need not live in Durban. In the same fashion when the Quran says, do they not consider the Quran with care? 
had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been contradiction. Just because the Quran says if it's not from Allah, there would have been contradiction, the vice versa need not be true. Just because there are contradictions, it, didn't, it need not mean that it's from anyone besides Allah. I know it's a bit confusing. This particular explanation is confusing. I will give you a simple example from the Quran. The Quran mentions Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 1 and 2, that all the believers are humble in prayers. Means all those who are true believers, they're humble in prayers. But now somebody will tell me that I know a person who prays five times a day, but still he cheats and he robs, etc. The Quran says all true believers are humble in prayers. The Quran does not say all those humble in prayer are true believers. If the Quran would have mentioned that all those who humble in all those who humble themselves in prayer are true believers, then the Quran would have been proved false. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken care how to reveal the Quran. I'd like to give you several examples. There are several examples you can give on mathematics. I'll just give you a few more. If you read the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number fifty nine, which says that as the similitude of Jesus, the similitude of Jesus is same as Adam. In the masala isa in the like masala Adam. Halakam in Turab, summa kala lo kun fayakun. That the similitude of Jesus in front of Adam is the same. He was created from dust and said, kun fayakun, be and it was. Meaning wise, there is no objection. Isa alayhi salam and Adam alayhi salam was created by kun fayakun, no objection. But if someone says that is the mentioning the same? And if you analyze in the whole Quran, the word Isa alayhi salam is mentioned 25 times. As well as the word Adam alayhi salam is mentioned 25 times. Besides the meaning being same, even the mentioning is same. If you refer to the Quran in Surah Araf, it says, chapter number 7, verse number 176, that as to those who reject our signs, they are like dogs. And if you refer in the whole Quran, the sentence, as to those who reject our signs, is mentioned five times. And the word for dog, the Arabic word is kalb, it's also mentioned five times. Besides the meaning being same, as those who reject our signs are like dogs, even the mentioning is same. If you refer to Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 19, it says that as to those who, who are blind, those who are blind are not the same as those who see. And if you count the word Amma, that's for blind, it is mentioned nine times in the Quran. And the word for those who see, it is Basir, it's mentioned 11 times. Besides the meaning being same, that the blind is not the same as those who see, even the counting, the mentioning in the Quran is not the same. One is nine and one is seven. And the verse continues in verse number 20 of chapter number 35, it says that the depths of darkness, that the word Zulumat, is not the same as light, that is Nur. And if you count, Zulumat has been mentioned in the Quran 23 times, besides the meaning being same. And the word Nur has been mentioned 24 times in the Quran. I mean, besides the meaning being same, even the mentioning is same. So the Quran is very carefully, it has been mathematically coded. And the wonder of the Quran is, besides the mentioning being same, I quoted a verse from the Quran from Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59, that inna masala isa in the laika masala adam, khalaqa min turab, summa qalo kun fayakun. That besides, in the whole Quran, the word Isa alayhi salam being mentioned 25 times, and, Ab and Adam alayhi salam being mentioned the same 25 times, even if you refer from the starting of the Quran till Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59, Isa alayhi salam is mentioned seventh time. And even the word Adam alayhi salam from Surah Fatiha till Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59, is mentioned the seventh time. Besides the total mentioning in the Quran being the same, even and that particular verse, from the start until that particular verse, it is the same. So no one can even change the order. No one can change the order because the moment you change the order, the mathematical code will be broken. So hope this answers the question that the Quran also speaks about mathematics. Are there any other questions?
the lady has posed the question that in the Quran it is mentioned that the two east and two west she is referring to an ad from Surah Rahman chapter 55 verse 15 to 17 it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the lord of two east and two west but today we only know of one east and one west so isn't the Quran conflicting with science science tells us that from the point where the sun rises it's called as due east and the point where the sun sets is called as due west but science also tells us that only on two days in the full year that during the equinox that the sun exactly rises from due east and sets exactly in due west in all the other days it either rises north or south of east and sets either north or south of west and if you analyze in the summer solstice that's 21st or 22nd of June the sun rises from one extreme of the east and in the winter solstice that's the 22nd or 23rd of December it sets on the it rises from the other extreme of east so the Quran refers that throughout the year the sun creeps on rising from different points and as well as sets in different points so when the Quran says Allah is the Lord of two east and two west it means that Allah is the Lord of the two extreme points of east and the two extreme points of west hope that answers the question brother for the question that has science analyzed that the first creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is light Noor in fact if a person goes too much into science normally people think he becomes an atheist so scientifically there is no proof as such amongst the scientists about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but with the help of the Quran we can very easily prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and according to a famous scientist he said that if you have little knowledge of science it makes you an atheist but if you have in-depth knowledge of science it makes you to believe in Almighty God but no scientist has so far proved by science the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but with the help of the Quran we as Muslims can very well prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as I said you can easily pose the question to an atheist that who could have written all these matter all this data mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago who else besides the creator and I've also given a talk on is the Quran the word of God and I've proved in several ways the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with logic, region and sand and also proved that that Quran is the word of God but science so far as my knowledge goes has not given any comment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initially knew or not hope that answers the question I believe the sisters are more interested in science than the brothers they ask me more questions the sisters pose the question that how can you prove regarding Darwin's theory because according to Darwin's theory man was created from ape and this contradicts with the Quranic philosophy the Quran says that the first man to be created was Adam al -Salam, and but naturally was not an ape so how can we prove or how can we correlate between the Darwin theory and the Quranic principles if you analyze the Darwin theory he wrote his theory in a book called as Origin of Species and he had traveled to an island called as Calotropis in a ship called as HMS Beagle and there he found that the beaks that is the finches the beaks of the finches that the birds they differed they became small and big depending upon the niches in which it used to pick in which is to peck so the the beaks of the finches kept on altering and he based his theory only on this observation but he had no proof that one species transformed into into another species and this misgiving he wrote in a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in 1861 where he said that I have got no proof in which one species transforms into another species 
I'm only giving the basis of my natural selection because it's much more easier for classification of embryology and morphology and geological succession. Ms. Darwin himself said that he had no particular proof for his theory. That's the reason if you want to insult any particular human being, we say that if you were present at the time of Darwin, you, you are the missing link to Darwin's theory. Darwin's theory would have been proved right indirectly trying to insinuate him or insult him that he looks like an ape. So Darwin had no particular proof. But unfortunately, this Darwin theory is taught, was taught all over the world as a scientific fact. It was only a theory, but not a scientific fact. And even if we analyze, according to the statements made by P.P. Grasset in 1971, who, who held the chair of evolution in Paris, P.P. Grasset said that just based on few vestiges, there are a few skeletons that we find, we can't say that our ancestors have been evolved from ape. There is no direct link and the oldest complete skeleton that we have is of Lucy or the Australopithecus which lived three and a half million years ago and which died at the time of the Ice Age. Quran has got no objection. It is mentioned through a new chapter 71 verse number 4 that we have created man in stages. The next wave of hominod that we have was approximately much more closer to the human resemblance. And that particular wave died approximately 500,000 years to 150,000 years ago. Later on was the Neanderthal man, the third wave, which died about 100,000 years to 40,000 years ago. And the last wave was the Krog Magnon. Which, which is the closest resemblance to the human form. But science so far has shown no link between the ape species and the human species. There is no solid proof. And today, science and any scientist will agree that the Darwin theory has been disproved. Even by molecular way, by molecular biology, according to the scientist Craig, he said that you cannot prove that one species can alter into another species because the amount the amount of accuracy required is too great for one DNA from one species to alter into another species only one DNA the chances according to science is 1 raised to 10 into minus 50 zeros more than that and according to mathematics this is equal to 0 so one DNA to change into another species the chances are 0 how can the millions of DNA change from ape to human being? Today, the Darwin theory has been disproved and is no longer held as the correct theory. Therefore, Quran does not conflict with modern science. It does conflict with Darwin's theory which is outdated. Hope that answers the question, sister. That how come in modern science we can talk about millions of years before when, when we can only how can they talk about millions of years ago in archaeology? See, in science, in science, <laughs> there is a system of dating, backdating, in which they can identify how old a particular bone or a particular skeleton is. There is something like carbon dating, which is called a C14, you may have heard of. And, and by that carbon dating, you can come to know how old that particular material is. How old a particular material is. So when they get the skeleton, and if they do carbon dating on that skeleton, they can identify plus minus 50 years that how old that particular skeleton is. So with the help of carbon dating, you can identify how old that particular material is. So that's how science goes as back as 1000 years, 2000 years, and so on. Hope that answers the question. The sister, any question on the sister's side? Last question we can entertain. <laughs> But I can't hear. About year after. 
sister has posed the question that what does Quran speak about hereafter or for example life after death? How can sorry? In comparison with science. How can we prove the hereafter or the life after death in comparison with science? First we should know, sister, that science is not that much advanced. It has not advanced that much that it can prove everything. The way that I prove to a non-Muslim, to an unbeliever, regarding hereafter, if he wants to know any scientific, he wants, suppose a non-Muslim, pose me the question, how can he prove scientifically about the hereafter? So I say that since the Quran mentions about the hereafter, about the life after that, I believe in it. So he will pose the question, that means you're doing blind belief. I say, no brother, I don't do blind belief, it's a logical belief. And I explain to him that since if you gather all the matter in the Quran that speaks about science or any matter, approximately 80% of the matter in the Quran has been proved to be scientifically correct. 100% correct. Scientifically 100% correct. But the remaining 20% of the matter mentioned in the Quran is neither correct and neither wrong. It goes into the ambiguous slot. Because science has not advanced so far. But there's not a single verse in the Quran which can be proved to be scientifically wrong. So 80% you can say, take for example, is 100% correct and the remaining 20% is ambiguous. Neither correct, neither wrong. So I would place life after death in this 20% ambiguous slot. But my logic tells me that if 80% of the Quran is 100% correct and the remaining 20% is ambiguous, neither right, neither wrong, my logic says that even this 20% will be correct. So I am basing, I am saying life after this is correct on a logical base, not on blind belief. So if the 80% is correct, I say that even the remaining 20% will be correct. Unless anyone proves to me one particular verse of the Quran to be scientifically wrong, then can be possible this life after death can also be wrong. But since not a single verse of the Quran can be proved scientifically wrong, I say that logically even this particular aspect is correct. This is one of the ways in which you can prove to the unbeliever that there is life after death. And another way which you can prove that there is life after death is that you ask a simple question to, to the non-Muslim. That do you consider being dishonest as good or bad? Yes brother, is it good or bad? Being dishonest is, good or, is bad. Robbing is good or bad? Bad. Raping a girl is good or bad? Okay. Now the person who is posing me this question, but natural, he's an atheist. And, or maybe he believes in God, but he does not believe in the hereafter. So I pose him a simple question. Can you prove to me, can you give me one logical reason why stealing is good or bad? I'm sorry, why it is bad. Can you give me one logical reason why raping a girl is bad? Can you give me brother? One logical reason only. Why stealing is bad? That's what brother's point. He said that you're taking something from someone who does not belong to you. It does not make a difference to me. No, but the person that owns it, maybe he works very hard for it and gains it. It does not make a difference to me if I'm robbing somebody's money as long as I'm gaining out of it. <coughs> Suppose if I rob somebody's wallet. And if I get a thousand rand, I can have a good luxurious dinner and I can enjoy life. Correct? I'm least bothered whether it is causing harm to the person I'm robbing. What? Give me one logical reason why it is bad. For me, it's not bad. See, I'm gaining because I, as a, you as a person, you, you do not believe in God or you're atheist. Or at least you do not believe in the hereafter. So for me, if even I do not believe in the hereafter, I feel robbing is good. Give me one logical reason why it is bad. Some may say that if you rob, somebody will come and rob your money. I am telling I am a great smuggler, suppose for example. I have a lot of bodyguards. I have a lot of bodyguards. No one can rob me. I have all the power. I have got many men to protect me. I have got many security guards. So. I can easily rob anybody else's money, but no one can rob from me. Now I'm saying that robbing is bad. And if you pose me the question, 
Why robbing is bad? I will tell you that even if it benefits you in this world materially, in the hereafter, you will be punished for it. The only logical reason you can give that robbing is bad is that you have to tell him that even if you get away with it in this world, you will be held responsible in the next world. Even if you get away with raping, you may enjoy it. In this world, you can easily, you can easily play hide and seek with the police. You can dodge the police. If you are caught, you can easily bribe the lawyer. So maybe in this world you will benefit materially, but surely in the next world you will be held responsible. I want to know that whatever law you have in this world, suppose Hitler incinerated 6 million Jews, what punishment can you give him in this world which is equivalent to his crime? Can you name any punishment brother? The only punishment that can be equivalent is in the hereafter. So logically, robbing is bad can only be proved if you believe in hereafter. Raping is bad can only be proved if you believe in the hereafter. The only equivalent punishment you can give to certain crimes which are so exorbitant as the criminal crime that done by Hitler is in the hereafter. As the Quran says, we will substitute new skin so that he feels the pain. He can be incinerated more than 6 million times in hell, but not in this world. So in this way of argument, you can also prove to the unbeliever that there is life after death. Hope that answers the question, sister. I think we'll end the session. Jazakallah khair for that wonderful exercise. And I think we ought to thank Dr. Zahir Muhammad Naik <coughs> a great deal. In fact, he has actually strengthened our iman. Because philosophically speaking, an action can only be said to be good if the result is good. Or it can only be said to be bad if the result is bad. And how are we as mortals to guarantee as to whether that action that we are going to perform is either good or bad? But really speaking, if we rely on a source, who possesses comprehensive knowledge, then of course we can safely say that whatever line of action we take, the result will obviously be a good one. And of course, knowledge of that kind can only be found in the Holy Quran. As the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala wasallama rightfully stated, in Allah that Allah raises many by means of this kitab and He causes many to fall by means of the same. I should thank one and all for spending a great deal or great amount of your time. This shows that you are really concerned and that we hope for humanity. Once again, Zakallah Khairan Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik. I will request the Sheikh to come forward for a short to ask.